And welcome to the Global View on this Thursday. Well, US inflation increased by the most in 14 months in August, driven by the rising cost of fuel, which jumped by more than 10%. The consumer price index increased by 0.6% last month to take the annual rate to 3.7%. But over the same period, core CPI, which excludes food and fuel, increased 4.3%, the smallest year-on-year rise since September 2021. The decline in underlying inflation is enough for financial markets to price in a less than 50% chance of the Fed raising interest rates again this year. The inflation data saw Treasury yields edge low with the two-year yield down to 4.97% and the 10-year note falling below 4.25%. US dollar strengthened against most major currencies, the Aussie trading at 64.2 US cents. Well, to get across that uh, latest inflation data out of the States and to look ahead, at the European Central Bank's decision tonight, I caught up with Mathieu Savry from BCA Research. Well, they did show a little bit of an increase in the core CPI, but uh, it was mostly a reflection of uh, the rebound in airfares. It was associated also uh, with some um, shelter components, specifically shelter away from home, uh, which is very noisy. Uh, but overall, because we are seeing the owner equivalent rent continuing to decelerate, uh, the firm's view at BC Research is still very much that uh, inflation in the US, core CPI as well, uh, will continue to decelerate over the next uh, few months, which means that it, the number itself did not change much uh, for the outlook for the Fed and uh, doesn't suggest that the Fed will hike at the upcoming meeting. All right. Beyond that, do you think there's a good chance that they will remain on hold until the end of the year? Uh, yes, it is still our base case scenario that the Fed remains on hold uh, till the end of the year. Uh, the labor market is starting to slacken a little bit and uh, uh, the outlook for inflation remains benign enough that since policy rates are very much in tight territory right now, um, there is no real need to increase rates further, uh, keeping them at an elevated level for an extended period of time uh, should do the job. Mathieu, let's switch to Europe and what we're seeing there at the moment with the latest data showing industrial production continuing to weaken. Um, how would you view the Eurozone economy? Of course, this comes ahead of the ECB meeting. Well, the Eurozone economy is soft. Um, that is definitely uh, still true. Uh, this is not surprising. We are seeing a global industrial cycle that remains quite weak. So the European uh, industrial sector is very exposed to those dynamics. Um, on a go-forward basis, though, we are seeing signs that the global industrial cycle, as weak as it may be, uh, may start to stabilize. The global new order to inventory ratios uh, has started to hook up a little bit. We've observed the same phenomenon uh, in the United States. Uh, meanwhile, in China, the deflation of the industrial sector has begun to ease. Uh, last Friday, we went from minus 4.4 on PPI to minus 3%, so real rates in China uh, are declining a little bit, which uh, suggests that the headwinds to the CapEx cycle there are still present, but are uh, becoming less strong than they were uh, in the first half of the year. So while Europe is still definitely weak, if the global industrial cycle is indeed hooking up, as we are hypothesizing is the case right now, uh, the European industrial cycle uh, will fare better. Meanwhile, when we look at consumer confidence, it's been rebounding. Real wages are doing quite well. So this suggests that the consumption side of the European economy uh, is likely to improve in the coming months. So uh, fr from that then, Mathieu, what's your outlook just as far as uh, expectations for EPS growth? So we anticipate that EPS growth in the Eurozone will continue to soften because EPS are not linked 
that directly to real economic activity. They're actually driven by nominal GDP growth. Specifically, when we think about Europe, nominal GDP growth in the US and in the Eurozone. And here, with inflation continuing to decelerate, with uh, producer prices in Europe and in the United States that are quite soft right now, uh, this is consistent with earning slowing down uh, further in the coming uh, quarter or two uh, for Europe. The additional issue remains China. Again, China hasn't bottomed. It could bottom in the next few months. But the lagged impact of the weak import growth of China, as well as the deflation in China, is consistent with slightly narrower European profit margins. Uh, so what is your outlook then for the ECB and what it's likely to do? So for tomorrow, we anticipate that the ECB will increase interest rates uh, by 25 bips, but most likely highlight that we are very, we're done with the increase in interest rate right now. The reason why I lean and I've leaned for quite a few weeks uh, toward an interest rate increase in September is twofold. First of all, uh, the recent wage numbers that we got out of Germany and other European economies are still in consistent with the ECB's mandate. Now, wages are very much a lagging indicator, but we have to remember that the ECB is a one-mandate central bank. It only focuses on inflation, and the wage number are still not consistent with its objective. Uh, secondly, the speakers of the ECB for the last few weeks were trying to give the message that the meeting was live and that there was a chance that interest rates were increasing. We saw it from uh, the governor of the Bank of uh, the Netherlands, the Central Bank of Germany, and Isabel Schnabel, an important member of the Governing Council, uh, highlighted that uh, the labor market in Europe is still tight and still uh, consistent with higher inflation and therefore uh, it was too early to uh, press away from the brake pedal. Mm. So all of that together suggested that the ECB, in my opinion, will increase rates tomorrow. And that is Mathieu Savry from BCA Research. Well, oil prices are marginally lower in line to the expected US crude inventories. Uh, Brent futures settling overnight at $91 a barrel. However, as we saw those US inflation figures, uh, they increased by the most in 14 months at a headline level, driven by the rising cost of energy, in particular gasoline in the States, which jumped by more than 10% over the month. Well, for analysis of what's going on in the oil sector, I caught up with Stuart Glickman from CFRA Research. Prices for sure have been on the rise of late. Um, demand has picked up pretty strongly this year, uh, prob looking at probably about a little over 2 million barrels a day of growth globally in a 100 million barrel a, day, barrel a day market. That's a little bit above average. And at the same time, uh, refining capacity really has not kept pace. Uh, there was a fair amount of refining capacity, at least in the States, that was shut down um, at the very beginning of the pandemic because no one knew how long this was going to last. And it's not the kind of thing where you can just suddenly bring back new capacity. Uh, it's not the way the industry works. Uh, and so, you know, we're looking at, at, at really tight, really high utilization for refiners, and that's, that's helping push uh, fuel prices higher. Uh, overall, uh, we also I see that uh, there are larger than expected US crude inventories at the moment. That's sort of balanced with uh, what we're seeing with demand, particularly out of China. Right. So on the inventory front, you know, we're in the neighborhood of around 420 million barrels um, of crude in the U.S. Now, that's below the five year average. It's about four percent below the five year average. But it wasn't that long ago um, that we were at around 480 million barrels. So it has been coming down in the past months. Um, gasoline remains below the five year average. Diesel is particularly below the five year average, more like 15 percent below. And so what I think this speaks to is, is demand still kind of outpacing what supply can bring to the table. Um, and so, you know, you have, you know, you have demand growth, you have not that much supply. And so that's, you've seen it in price points for WTI and for Brent, they've been moving up.
Yeah, you talk about demand there, and I was just flagging what's going on in China, clearly, uh, with that weakness in the economy. So how is that likely uh, to, well, what's the outlook there for that more global demand, I guess, and given what we've also seen from those OPEC Plus members in particular, Saudi Arabia and Russia extending their cuts? Right, so two great points. So on the first one on China, um, we had been a little bit more skeptical earlier in this year that China was gonna be able to deliver. Uh, what we've seen in the last month or so is China's economy is, now granted from low levels, it is starting to accelerate. And so I think um, China's ability to pace around 2 million barrels a day of growth this year looks more realistic to us today than it did, let's say, six weeks ago. Um, now, on the supply front uh, and the OPEC plus participants that you mentioned, Russia and Saudi Arabia, both of them recently announced they were committed to these voluntary cuts through year end, which is taking what had already been a fairly um, significant degree of cuts by the consortium as a whole and made them even stronger. And so that, I guess, self-discipline by these two major participants uh, is helping keep supply on, you know, not that high. And so that's why we've gone from roughly $70 a barrel for WTI to close to 90 in not that much time. All right. And, and then you look at the outlook, I guess, uh, domestically there in the States with the prospect perhaps that rates will remain on hold. But uh, moreover, when you mm -hmm. look at demand, uh, domestically there, what's your outlook? So I think demand in the US is going to be reasonably good, probably up um, very low single digits, but it's a developed economy. You don't expect um, you know, demand growth to be that high. Uh, what's intriguing to me is on the supply side in the States. Um, you know, most publicly traded companies, you know, the EOGs, the pioneer natural resources of the world, they did not chase high oil prices last year by ramping up production materially. Their cash flows certainly ramped up. But what they did is they took those cash flows and plowed a good chunk of them into other avenues that, that investors like, notably buybacks and dividends. And so because they weren't chasing production, um, US production this year is getting close to that 13 million barrel a day level, which is around prior peaks, but they have not been chasing it you know, really much at all this year. The rate counts are down about 16% this year. So because oil prices fell, you know, fell off earlier this year, they were not caught having spent too much money on CapEx upstream and then discovered that that oil prices had had fallen apart. Uh, so they're in, you know, very stable, you know, in my opinion, a very stable situation. Uh, their cash flows should remain very strong. And um, they're they're adding to this, conservatism on the producer front just for different reasons than Russia and Saudi Arabia. So, Stuart, overall, what's the CFRA outlook then on oil and gas exploration and production? So for EMPs overall, uh, we think the outlook is positive. Uh, we think um, the, you know, U.S. focused producers like an EOG uh, or a Pioneer or a Devon, um, they have the secular tailwinds at their backs. Um, and so they should be able to generate a fair amount of free cash flow. Uh, we have buy opinions right now on EOG Resources uh, and Devon. Uh, we have a hold opinion on Pioneer, uh, just on valuation. And, and what are you looking with the strategy there from those EMPs in particular, I guess, in terms of CapEx? Uh, or are they more likely to go for, for dividends and buybacks, do you think? Yeah, you know, the, the, it's, it's an interesting point. The investors in energy who survived what had been a pretty tepid seven years between 2014 and 2021 have really encouraged the industry to adopt first you know dividend growth and then as well uh, buybacks and we've also seen um, the advent of variable dividends so that you're not committing yourself long term uh, to a high dividend just in case oil prices fall apart again um, Investors seem to really like that. Uh, in good times, we've seen yields get as high as about 8%, even 9%, mostly on the variable front. And so I think they're trying to placate their shareholders and they are saying, you know what, it's income growth first, production growth second. Uh, and I don't expect that to change 
um, particularly given that you know a lot of this, a lot of the strength that's coming from oil prices these days, at least some of it is coming from high discipline by Saudi Arabia and Russia, and who knows how long that persists. So better to be safe than sorry, I think. Stuart Glickman from CFRA Research out of the States. That is The Global View. Stay with us. The Open is up next.